Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jordan, and I am the manager of online education programs at COSI. I am excited to have you all today for the 2020 COSI Science Festival. We are starting the program right at noon here today, so if you hear our noon whistle, I apologize for that. Uh, we are excited to have you joining for the festival. The festival has moved from a four-day physical event to an all-day digital format, uh, May 6th through 9th. During the festival, people can celebrate science by attending events just like this, ranging on topics from mindfulness to learning all about oxalotls. If you don't know what an oxalotl is, I suggest you check out that program. Let's see, on May 9th, then, we are coming together for the big science celebration. And unfortunately, we aren't able to host that in person, but we are hosting it virtually. We invite all of you to do some science activities at home and share your videos and photos using social media on social media using the hashtag COSI Sci Fest. You can make a volcano or show us your COSI slime. We'd love to see your experiments. And again, share those with us on social media using COSI Sci Fest. And of course, we couldn't host any of these events without our sponsors and partners of the COSI Science Festival. We want to give them a big shout out, especially our visionary sponsor, Battelle. We certainly couldn't have done this without you. Now, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our program today for lunch with arthropods and our presenter, Jenny La Ra Rausch. Excuse me. Thank you very much, Jenny, for joining us. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Make sure I am, am I unmuted? Yes, we are good to That's go, good. thank you. Okay, let's get started. So thanks for joining me for bug lunch today, guys. I am coming to you live from my bedroom floor and I have a bunch of my animals here. My name's Jenny and I work at Ohio State and I work for the entomology department. And entomology is the study of insects. So I have a background in husbandry, which means I have an education in animal behavior and my job is to take care of animals. So I run a little bug zoo, basically. And since we are all quarantined and staying in our houses, um, my bug zoo is in my dining room. So it's been pretty interesting since March, to say the least. So today I wanna talk about some of the creatures that I have, and we're gonna talk about the food chain. And we're gonna talk about what they eat and what eats them, because arthropods are a really important part of the food chain. So an arthropod is anything with an exoskeleton. So where's your skeleton? If you're a human being and we're mammals and we're primates, where are our exos, where are our They're on the inside and they're covered in fat and muscle and tendons and cartilage and with skin on the outside. Well, arthropods have all of their fat and all that kind of stuff and all of their organs on the inside and there's no bones and then they have a shell on the outside and we call that an exoskeleton. So humans have an endoskeleton, which means on the inside and arthropods have an exoskeleton. So let me pull out the first bugs and they're not technically all bugs. Um, a bug is a really specific type of arthropod, but it's okay, you can call them bugs. If you say bug, everybody knows what you're talking about. So that's a word that we, it's okay to use that even if it's not technically correct. So bugs start out, so mammals give birth to live young. So people have babies, dogs have puppies, things like that. Those are mammals, but bugs have a different way of reproducing. They lay eggs usually. So these guys, some of you might recognize them. These are giant mealworms. And their technical term, the technical name, the Latin name is Zephobus morio. And these are giant mealworms. So if anybody has a pet, gecko or bearded dragon or maybe some frogs or tarantulas you probably recognize these because they make really good food for those animals and now these are actually baby beetles so these are larvae and the beetles eggs, and then the eggs turn into these wiggly little larvae and they're not actually worms worms are worms their whole life larvae later will turn into Let's see if I can grab a couple of these grown-ups. So larvae will pupate, which means they will go through a change and then they will mature into these guys. So these are called darkling beetles. I hope you can see them there. And these are insects. 
So see, they have six legs. See their antenna there? They're feeling around. They're not used to being in this room. They're used to being in my dining room. So they're kind of exploring right now. Um, and these are what the mealworms turn into. So the mealworms are the young animals and these are the adult animals and they're the same species. It's the same bug. So these guys, when they were little babies, they were the, like the mealworms that I just showed you, they were larva. And now these adults, we don't really feed to the other animals because that exoskeleton, see how they're colored black? There's a lot of chitin in that exoskeleton and chitin is a material that's really hard and it splinters kind of like obsidian. So we don't usually feed these to the animals that we have, um, but we do feed the larva to a lot of animals. And these guys live in Central and South America and they eat, they're called detritivores or omnivores. So vor means to eat. So if you say omnivore, omni means everything. So omnivore means they eat everything. Detritivore means they eat detritus, which is what we call leaf litter. That's dead leaves that fall on the forest floor or rotting fruit that falls on the forest floor. There's a lot of fruiting trees in Central and South America. So these guys would definitely take advantage of that. And they would just eat those. These are not predators. So they're not gonna go catch any food or eat any live food. They're just gonna eat things that fall and they're gonna kind of be part of the cleanup crew of the forest. So speaking of cleanup crew, I have another, I have two other animals that are part of the cleanup crew. Let's see if these guys, you now these guys have a reputation. Let's see, they make, they make a noise. Let's see if we can get them to make a noise. I'm gonna poke them a little bit. Oh, did you hear it? I don't know if the microphone can pick that up. We'll see if you can hear it. Okay, let's pull them out. So these are Madagascar hissing cockroaches. And I pulled out two of my biggest ones. These are pretty big. And these are both big males. They live in Madagascar, which is an island off the east coast of the African continent. And these guys are also detritivores. So if you were walking along in the baobab forests in Madagascar, you would find these guys maybe um, maybe under like a rotting log or maybe in a little precipice with some rocks around they would have little colonies that they would live in and these guys are harmless i actually looked up the guinness world record for the biggest hissing cockroach because i thought i might have the biggest in the world not this guy but i have another one who's even bigger that i couldn't get out of the tank today but now he's not the biggest in the world he is pretty big though and if you look on the back here do you see these kind of like horns on the back? And that's really on his shoulders, but this is a big mature male. And that's how you can tell the big mature males because they have those kind of horns on their back. And I've got another mature male here who's a little bit smaller, but I'm gonna pull him out and you can see his, his horns as well. And you see they kind of have those little bumps on their back and the males will actually use those to battle. So there's a rock in their tank that they really like to sit on, but there's not enough room for too many cockroaches. So if one big male is up there and another one wants to sit on there, he'll come up and they'll battle for the rock. And it's pretty cool. Someone wants to know, can they fly? Nope, these guys don't have any wings. So you see these are mature males, meaning they're fully grown and they have no wings. So they just live on the forest floor and under logs. And these guys are also detritivores like the beetles that I showed you. And they, here in my house and in the bug zoo, they eat dog food and they also eat fruit. So they do need a little bit of protein in their diet and dog food's a really good way to give them that protein. Um, and then I, I go and I buy them fruit because we take really good care of our bugs at OSU. So they don't eat um, just detritus. We go and buy them really fresh fruit. And I, I try a lot of different things because I wanna see what they like to eat the best. And I wanna make sure they get a lot of variation in their diet. Okay, does anybody have any questions? I do see some questions coming in. I wanna make sure everyone knows uh, we are taking questions in the chat today. So if you are on a computer or a PC, you can hover over your window and open the chat button there uh, if you click that. If you are on a mobile device, you might have to tap your screen and you can switch between the chat and back to the video after you ask your question. We're getting a lot of questions. They wanna know how long do they live? Several people ask that question. <laughs> Okay, these guys actually can live like 12 to 15 years. They can live a really long time. Um, they make really good pets. They're really easy to take care of. 
Um, they probably would need a heat lamp just because they like it to be pretty warm. Um, if your house gets really warm or in the summertime, um, if it gets hot in your house, you won't need one. Um, but you can just give them a food dish and a water dish, put them in like a 10 gallon tank, and they're very simple to take care of. And they're really fun to watch. They have really cool behaviors that are fun to watch. You can see their antennas moving around. They're, they're investigating their surroundings right now. We have a question from Kate. Uh, you mentioned the world record for the biggest one. How big is that one? Uh, if I remember correctly, I think it was like almost five inches, which is huge. These guys are maybe three inches. So that was a really, I was probably not even close with mine, but I walked by the tank one day and noticed how big he was getting. And I was like, oh, I think I have the biggest cockroach in the world. But I was disappointed to see that I did not. That's okay. They're still pretty cool. And they're still really big. I mean, look how big these things are. So how big do they lay at a time? I'm just seeing a couple of these pop up at the bottom. I can't see all of them. Um, that's a good question. So this type of cockroach has what we call um, they're ovoviviparous, which is the appearance of live birth. So what happens is the female will have an egg sac called an utheca, and that utheca actually will stay inside her body, and she'll hold that egg sac inside her body until the babies are ready to hatch from the eggs. And then when the babies hatch from the eggs, they come out. So it is an egg-laying animal, but they actually hold those eggs inside their body. So it kind of looks like they're giving birth, like a, you know, like a dog would have puppies, but it's not exactly the same thing. Um, so they actually carry those eggs around with them. I have a question from Wyatt. He wants to know how many legs they have. They have six legs. They are an insect. They're a hexapod. And let me see, you can see three on this side, kind of. And you can kind of see them. It's hard because they're so jet black. It's kind of hard to see them. But they have, they have six legs total. And they have these little... I don't know if you can see them, but they have spikes all over their legs and that helps them to climb. And that's also a good defense. And those spikes are actually really sharp. It's kind of like the thorns on a rose. If, if I go to pick them up and I hold their leg a little too hard, it'll poke me a little bit. So I had to get used to that. And you have to be kind of careful when you pick them up or you'll get a little poke from their leg spikes, but they don't do it on purpose. Madeline wants to know, can they sting? Nope, they do not have stingers. Um, they also do not have mandibles, so they cannot bite. Um, their mouth parts are basically like little mouth fingers. And when they eat, what they do is they, oh, he's kind of investigating. You can see his mouth right now. See below his antennas, what looks like another antenna? Those are actually his mouth parts. And so what they do, like if I, like I gave them mango yesterday, for example, and I put a big piece of mango in their tank, and they'll go over and they just kind of slobber on it until it turns into goo and then they eat that. So they don't have um, hard mandibles, so they can't bite, they can't sting. They're, they're pretty harmless, but they want you to think that they're big and scary, which is why they hiss. But these guys are not being very hissy today. They're pretty used to me touching them, to be honest. So they're pretty habituated, so they don't get very defensive. Okay, let's take one more question and then I'll go on to the next bug. Samantha wants to know if you have females and what's the difference between them? Um, yeah, I do have females. I should have brought one. Um, they basically look the same. Uh, the females do not have these horns on their backs. Um, and the males do, um, the males tend to get a little bit wider, um, but sometimes the females are actually a little bit longer than, than the males, um, but they look pretty much the same. We call that sexual dimorphism. So that means, so di meaning separate and morph meaning shape. And then the prefix sexual means between the males and the females. So when animals have sexual dimorphism, it means that the boys look different from the girls. Um, but it's not very obvious. The girls just don't have these little bumps on their backs. Okay, let's try the next one. Got a bunch of bugs here. And then I've got some things that aren't bugs as well that I wanna show you. Their little leg spikes are sticking to my hand. I'm trying to put them away, hang on one second. Anything can happen with live animals. So they're live, coming to you live with live animals. Okay, let's look at another insect. So these guys, this is another beetle, and these live in the American Southwest. And these are called blue death feigning beetles. Now I'm gonna see if I can show you guys. See that pretty blue color? They look like little blueberries. And now if you surprise these guys, I'm just gonna flip them over and we'll see if they'll do it. Do you see? They pretend to be dead. 
very convincing, isn't it? They're very dramatic. It looks like a very dramatic death. <laughs> but they're just pretending, they're playing. Because if a predator came and surprised them and they pretended to be dead, the predator would be a little bit less interested in, the, in a dead animal. A lot of predators are really spurred on the chase by, by, an, by their prey uh, running or struggling. That's called a prey chase mechanism. Um, and so if animals stop and play dead, um, they're a little bit less, a little bit less interested. And so you can see they're starting to wiggle just a little bit and they can actually hold this position for an hour or more. Um, but these guys also are a little bit habituated to touch. I play with them a lot. So they only usually play dead for a couple minutes. Oh, and see, they can flip themselves back over. We'll see if they'll do it. Oh, there he goes. He's not scared anymore. So he's not playing dead anymore. Okay, I want to have a couple of questions about these guys. It looks like a few. Why are they called that? They're called death feigning beetles because they feign death because they pretend to be dead. That's kind of the most um, the most common behavior that you can find with them. And these guys are actually really, really difficult to rear in captivity. Um, most places have not been able to get them to reproduce in captivity. The Cincinnati Zoo has had a little bit of luck. Um, but these animals are actually wild caught. So these were caught in Arizona. Um, and normally we don't want to catch wild animals and bring them into captivity, but these are not endangered. They are called an animal of least concern. So that means there's lots and lots of them in the wild. And so right now it's okay for us to collect them. Um, and hopefully we can figure out how to get them to reproduce in captivity so that we can leave those wild populations alone. These guys I are would like to know what they eat. These guys are also omnivores. And something that's really interesting is I give them fruit. I also give them dog kibble like I do with the um, hissers. But one thing that's really important for these guys is that every once in a while, I'll give them a dead cricket or a dead mealworm. So they actually like to eat carrion. So carrion is a dead animal. So like if you see roadkill on the side of the road, that's carrion. And there's a lot of animals that rely on that like vultures or like these guys, or like dermested beetles, which I have some dermested beetles, but they're itty bitty. So I didn't bring them because they wouldn't show up on camera. But those animals are really important in the ecosystem because they take care of that, um, of all of that dead stuff and they clean that up for us. So they have a really, really important role to play. So I actually give them once in a while and they'll eat that, but they're not predators. They don't go and kill their prey, um, but they will eat something that's already dead. Lucas would like to know why they're blue. That's a really good question. So actually, um, these guys, so remember those first beetles I showed you were black, and I said that they have a chitinous exoskeleton. So these guys actually have the same type of exoskeleton, but their body produces a wax. They have some glands that produce a wax, and they spread that all over themselves, because these guys live in the desert, and they want to really hold on to that humidity and keep any moisture inside their body, so they kind of seal themselves up with this wax, and the wax makes them look blue. And so if I were to expose them to too much humidity, if I were to spray down their tank or put too much water in there or spill their water dish and they get wet, they would actually just turn black because all of that wax would kind of be moistened. But that's not a good thing. You wanna make sure they stay blue because they're the healthiest when they're in their natural state. Okay, I wanna do one more question. Um, Daxton would like to know if they have teeth. They do not have teeth. These have mouths very similar to um, the hissing cockroaches. So they have little, um, little mouth fingers and they just kind of gnaw on stuff a little bit. Um, but they don't have um, fangs and they don't have um, hard mandibles. So they can't bite or sting or anything. That's the thing that a lot of people want to know about a bug. Can it hurt you? Can it hurt you? And the truth is that most bugs can't. Um, and the ones that do have a defensive mechanism like fangs or a stinger or something like that, um, Usually they don't want they don't want to come at you. They're not aggressive. They don't want to hurt you. They just use those to defend themselves and to defend their homes. So if we're respectful of those animals, often we don't have to deal with being bitten or pinched or stung or any of those things. A lot of people ask me if I've ever been bitten or stung by anything, and the answer is no. I'm very respectful of the animal that I do hold, and I've learned from interacting with them how to read their body language. And I've learned how to tell if they are willing to be touched or not willing to be touched and I respect that. And 
I've never had a tarantula bite me. I've never had um, a centipede pinch me because um, centipedes actually don't have fangs. They actually have pinchers um, up by their mouths. Um, but I don't have any centipedes today. But I do have, speaking of centipedes, I do have some, let me put the lid back on this so they don't escape in my room. I do have some millipedes. So millipedes and centipedes are really different. They are related. These are called Narcissus. They are actually an American millipede. You could actually find these in your backyard. So millipedes and centipedes are called myriapods. And that means many feet. And so centipedes are predators. So centipedes catch live prey and then they eat it. Millipedes are detritivores. So just like the cockroaches, they eat things that fall on the forest floor. They eat leaf litter and they actually eat soil. And they are really important to the ecosystem because they turn that soil, they kind of till it up bit by bit. And it's really good for plants and trees. These, are, these guys are kind of a, uh, a keeper of the forest. But it's really, really important to the ecosystem. Put this down a little bit. For them to be present. And there's a couple of key differences. So these guys actually do have a mandible and it helps them chew on things. Um, and they do not have any pinchers and they are very slow moving. So centipedes do have pinchers up near their mouths and they are very, very fast. Centipedes are very fast predators. But these are millipedes. And so if you look really closely, I don't know if you can see the detail, but you can see there are actually body segments. So there's actually little, they almost look like stripes. So each one of those stripes is a body segment. And every body segment for a millipede has two pairs of legs. So every body segment has four legs. With a centipede, every body segment has two legs. So they have one pair for every body segment. Do you guys have any questions about millipedes? Jason wants to know if they can walk up walls. Um, these ones cannot, um, not, not a smooth surface. Um, they could walk up like maybe the side of a tree or something because it's really rough and they can hold on to that, um, but they couldn't climb up a wall. Um, but some centipedes can. It depends on the centipede. Lisa would like to know what their favorite environment is. Their favorite environment is like the forest floor. So these guys, they live subterranean in subterranean tunnels, tunnels. So they like to live underground. So the tank that these guys live in is actually about three quarters of the way full with dirt. And I just put their food on the surface of the dirt and then they can come up and get it whenever they want. Um, but they have a whole network of underground tunnels that they live in and that's where they sleep and that's where they hide and that's where they raise their babies. Um, and I never ever disturb that dirt. It naturally will break down because they're eating it and tunneling through it. So I just add on the top, but you never want to go through and mix that up. You just want to kind of let it, let it be. And these guys eat vegetables, but they also eat dog food and they eat fish food too. So fish food is also a good protein source that you can use with bugs. And I think their favorite food is probably cucumber. Because whenever I put cucumber in there, it, it is gone. Within a, within a couple minutes, they mow that stuff down. So I think that's their favorite. Christy would like to know what the benefit of having all those legs is. The benefit of having the legs, that's a good question. Um, I think that maybe just they have evolved to move through their little tunnels this way and that can kind of help them move underground. But really the way that evolution works is not that it's ever working towards something, it's that something either works or it doesn't. So an animal has a form and if they can live successfully and have babies and live in an environment, they will pass on those genes of that form to the next generation and that shape that they take will persist. Um, and if something doesn't work and it prevents them from living and prevents them from breeding, then it will die out. Um, so basically these guys, they have just lived successfully for millions of years in this form and they're doing pretty good. So it doesn't seem like they're gonna go anywhere anytime soon, hopefully. As long as we don't use um, lawn chemicals, that's one thing that can really, really hurt millipedes is lawn chemicals. Especially if you treat for grubs, if you do grub treatments on your lawn, um, those are really penetrating chemicals that are going to go underground. And that's really bad for things that live underground like millipedes and also for fireflies. If you really like fireflies and you want to see those in the summer, one of the best things that you can do is not use chemicals on your lawn. 
Okay, let's go on to some other bugs. I have other stuff here. And we, I don't want to run out of time. Okay, so I'm going to feed some bugs to some bugs. So, well, we're going to see if they'll eat. So if you don't want to see a bug eat another bug, you might want to exit. But if you're interested to see how some predators hunt, we're going to see if we can do that live on camera. So we'll see if this will work. So these are not performing animals. They're just animals. And I'm going to offer one some food and we're going to see if it eats. It might not. She might not be hungry. But if she is hungry, then it'll be really interesting for you to see this. So let me take one second and set up. So I have this little bin here that she lives in. Let me see if I can scoot this down. And you can see the condensation on the top. This is an animal that likes high humidity. I'm just gonna gently take that off. Can you see her? That's a tarantula. So this is called a Honduran curly hair tarantula. And this is a female. I know for sure this is a female. Um, and she loves to eat bugs. So now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna grab, try to keep an eye on her. And I'm gonna grab one of these mealworms. Whoop. They're hard to grab, they're very wiggly. And I'm gonna see if she is interested in eating. She might not be, and I'm not gonna force her to if she's not interested, so we'll see. I can kind of tap, tap, tap over here and see if she's interested in eating. Come here, baby. Want some food? She's a little camera shy. She may or may not be interested. We'll just see what she thinks. I'm hoping to bring her over here so you can see a little better. If I was to put this right in front of her face, she might grab it. Um, but I don't think you would see it very well in the position she's in right now. I don't know if you can see her. And I know for sure this is a female because um, tarantulas will molt their skin. Oh no, I dropped it. Um, tarantulas will molt their exoskeletons as they grow. Um, and you can take that exoskeleton and you can look at the reproductive organs and you can see if it's a male or a female. Come here, baby. Want some food? Maybe. We'll give her a second, see if she's interested. She might not be. You can also, I'm just going to drop it right next to her and see if she has any interest in that. She might not eat it. Oh, there she goes. See if you can see her. Oh, she grabbed it. <laughs> can you see that? <laughs> Hopefully you can see. See those? those yeah, that, does that work? Yeah, we were able to see that. Okay, cool. So they can be really quick. And so she grabbed that as it walked by her. They're called ambush predators. So they wait until prey walks by and they just kind of reach out and grab it. And now you can see in the front there, she's got those chelicerae. And on the end of those chelicerae are her fangs. And the fangs are going to puncture the exoskeleton of the prey. And they're going to inject a digestive enzyme. And then that's gonna kind of turn the prey's guts into like a, kind of like a milkshake. And then basically what they do is they take their little arms. So spiders actually have eight legs, but they also have two arms and we call those pedipalps. And they'll take their pedipalps and they'll just kind of squeeze the guts out of the bug. And then they'll just kind of stuff that into their mouth hole. A lot of people think that they use their fangs like straws and they suck up the guts, but that's actually not how they work. That's, they, they work like hypodermic needles. So they inject the venom um, and then they just kind of squeeze the goo out that comes out and that's how they eat. So these guys live in Central America, they live in Honduras, and they live in very humid jungle areas. You can see her lifting up her little leg. She doesn't like it when they touch her legs. <laughs> so seeing that makes me think of how this food chain might work. Can you explain like a possible food chain for these animals? Yeah, so a lot of the times we think about um, tarantulas as these big scary predators that eat other things, but the reality is that tarantulas are eaten by a lot of animals and they're a lot, they're very, very likely in their life to be eaten um, by a predator. So things like lizards, toads and frogs, uh, birds, um, small mammals like raccoons or things that are similar to raccoons, those would all love to eat a tarantula and a tarantula would be a really good protein rich snack for them. So you could have the 
like let's say fallen fruit on the forest floor and the mealworm would eat that fruit and then a tarantula can eat that mealworm and then a bird could eat the tarantula and that's a big chain and all that energy kind of moves up the chain and in husbandry in what i do for my job um, we do a thing called gut loading and that's taking advantage of the food chain to make sure that your predatory animals like the tarantulas get enough nutrients so what we do is we take those mealworms and we feed them very nutrient rich food. And what happens is when the tarantula eats that mealworm, they will eat the gut contents of the mealworm and so then they will get those nutrients. So a tarantula would never eat fruit. You'd never catch a tarantula munching on a mango, but the mealworms will eat that. And then if I make sure the mealworms have a nice big meal and then feed it to the tarantula, the tarantula will get all the benefits and all the vitamins from the fruit, the fruit that the mealworm has eaten. And so that's how energy travels up the food chain. And now she's gonna go in her little burrow. And I have another good example. I have my last little creature here and we'll see if we can feed that creature too. I'm gonna set her over here and let her eat. And I have an animal here that is not a bug. Come here, buddy. This animal has an endoskeleton, just like we do. This is Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash is a leopard gecko, and he's my pet, and I have had him for 18 years. So he's, a, he's an old man. And so Johnny Cash has skin on the outside, and on the inside he has fat and muscle and tendons and cartilage, just like we do. So he has an endoskeleton, like we do but he is an insectivore. So insects are a really, really important part of the food chain and other animals like this guy rely on those insects for food. You can see his little tongue out. I love this little guy. I've had him since I was a teenager. And we're gonna see if he's interested in food. He's a little cold right now, um, just because he's not under his heat lamp. Um, but we're gonna see if he'll eat a mealworm. Don't walk off the edge of the table, buddy. He was eyeing up the mealworms. Earlier, I saw him. Let me see if I can grab one for him. So we'll put this here. Come here, buddy. Want it? Look. <laughs> and he might not be interested. He might be a little camera shy. And he's used to being in his tank, too. So we'll see if you can see that on camera. Come here, buddy. Oh. Oh. What is this? I don't know if you can hear that, but it's crunching a little bit. <laughs> and so I'll feed him probably three or four of these in a sitting. And he just eats, um, he doesn't eat every day. He just eats a couple times a week, actually. Um, younger leopard geckos need to eat more often. You get it? Oh, he's not a very good hunter. He probably wouldn't survive in the wild. <laughs> Come on, get it. You can do it. You can do it. Don't fall. Oh, and a miss. So they're not very good hunters. He's also really old, um, but he relies on insects. And the gut loading that I talked about is really important for him. So I have to make sure that these mealworms eat plenty of nutritious food so that Johnny Cash can get all the vitamins he needs. Um, because Johnny Cash has no interest in fruit, let me tell you. There, you finally got it. You don't want it? Did you drop it? All right. Does anybody have any questions? Lindsay would like to know how long do they normally live? Is that a normal um, age? Um, it, he's kind of old. If you Google it, I have, I have looked at a couple of different sources, and they actually say like five to six years, and that's crazy because these animals can live a really long time. I think that just most of the time when they're in captivity, maybe they're not being taken care of properly and so they don't live very long. Um, but my understanding is that if they, if they are very healthy and very well taken care of, that they can live for like 35 years. So hopefully he stays with me for a long time. If he lives to be 35, I'll be like almost, let's see, he's already almost 20. So I'll be like over 50. So hopefully he'll be around for a long time. Dan wants to know if they're good climbers. Uh, not 
really. <laughs> um, you want to give them things to climb on, but like, if you look, come here, come here, come here. If you look at his little legs, they kind of have little like, kind of stumpy legs. They're not very athletic. Um, he falls off of stuff sometimes. So I try not to put anything really high um, in his tank um, because I don't want him to fall. Grady wants to know if his tail is normally shaped like that or why is his tail shaped like that? Yeah, so they actually hold fat in their tails. So this means he's really good and he's healthy because he has a nice thick tail. Um, sometimes people who have leopard geckos will really feed them a lot and kind of overfeed them um, and they can get very, very chubby. Uh, but that's actually not very healthy for them. Um, but they will store fat in their tails. And if you have a leopard gecko, it should have a nice fat tail like that. Um, now, a lot of leopard geckos in captivity will lose their tails if you handle them roughly um, or if they get their tail caught in something, um, they can actually just drop the end of it. So they can just kind of release it and it won't hurt them. If they are grabbed by a predator in the wild, they can actually just kind of release that tail and it can come off like an emergency release basically. And hopefully that'll stay behind and the predator will get a mouthful of tail and the lizard will get away. Um, but I'm always really gentle with him. And so he still has his original tail. Um, it can regenerate a tiny bit, but it never really looks the same as an original tail. So he's doing pretty good. He's still got all his fingers and toes. Whoop, see, they're not very good climbers. Um, and he still has his original tail. And he also eats crickets. Um, crickets can carry some um, parasites and other things. So I try not to feed him crickets too often. Um, but I do give him a little bit of variation. There's also something called a wax worm. And he loves wax worms. Wax worms are very fatty. Maggie would like to know if they shed their skin. They do shed their skin. So for these guys, it is literally shedding their skin. So we say um, that tarantulas shed their skin, but what they're really shedding is their exoskeleton. Um, but these guys, their skin will come off in big sheets. And he sheds a couple times a year. And he'll actually pull that off with his teeth and eat it um, to, to kind of get those nutrients back. And there is one other thing I wanted to show you. So do you guys like to eat arthropods? Most people say no, but what about shrimp or a lobster or a crab? Those are all arthropods too. And we tend to eat those a lot. And a lot of people in different cultures also will eat um, arthropods. And I actually, so Johnny Cash just had his mealworm lunch and now I'm gonna have a little mealworm snack myself. So these are called larvettes and you can see those are mealworms. And you can just buy these online and they are flavored. These are cheddar cheese flavored. And I'm gonna have a couple of these as a snack. I can get the bag open. I should have opened this before I started. But there are lots of cultures where it's really common to eat arthropods all around the world. Really in the United States, we're kind of in the minority of people who um, don't really eat a lot of land dwelling arthropods, but it's perfectly healthy and it's perfectly safe and it's pretty tasty. So I guess now you could call me an insectivore. Ta-da. So now you have seen three different animals today eat mealworms. So those mealworms are really, really important to the food chain and they're the base of the food chain. So it would be really, really terrible if something happened and they all went extinct because then a lot of animals that rely on them would no longer have that food source and would have to find something else to eat. So all the way from the bottom of the food chain to the top, it's really important to protect all the animals along the way because there are other animals that rely on them. All right, do you guys have any more questions? You can just take questions for a couple of minutes and then we'll be done. I've showed you all of the creatures I brought today, so. Um, Aaron wanted to know how big your um, lizard is. Um, I actually haven't really, I think he might be like, nine inches long or so. He probably weighs a couple ounces. He might weigh like 
hmm, six ounces or something. He's not, not very heavy. Oh, maybe more than that. He might weigh. That's just a guess, but um, he's just a little guy. He's fully grown. He's not going to get any bigger than that. Um, leopard geckos aren't terribly large animals. And if you are ever interested in having a reptile as a pet, a leopard gecko is a really good starter reptile. Um, also ball pythons, if you want a pet snake, those are a really good starter. Um, they're really chill, you can handle them, and they're really easy to feed, and they don't get too big. So you don't want to start out with like an iguana as your first reptile, probably, because those can get really large, and they have complicated diets. Um, so these guys are really good to start with. Sarah wants to know what the mealworms taste like. Um, they're kind of like, um, they just taste like whatever you put on them. It's kind of like tofu where it tastes like nothing. And then whatever you, whatever sauce or seasoning you put on it, it just kind of takes on that taste. Um, I used to do some work with a local high school and we would make nachos. I would bring in a, uh, a little toaster oven and chips and all the nacho fixings and then mealworms. And uh, the mealworms do require a little bit of processing. Um, you want to fast them for a couple of days to get rid of their gut contents. And then um, you want to coat them in an oil and then you want to bake them. Um, you, some people will gut load them with like um, parsley or cilantro or something um, and then cook them. And then that way they will have that taste of the cilantro. Um, so there's a couple different ways to do it. Uh, I baked mine. And then when we made the nachos in our classroom, we put mealworms all over them. Devayani wants to know, um, what does a day look like in your lab? Um, it's really different every day, which I actually really like. Um, so the good thing about arthropods is you don't need to take care of them every single day. So with a dog, you have to feed it every day or multiple times a day. Um, you have to walk it every day or multiple times a day. You have to clean up after it. Um, and you can't really leave them alone for long periods of time. But arthropods, are a lot more low maintenance. So I can just take care of them like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And some of the animals only get taken care of once a week. Um, for example, tarantulas. Tarantulas are super low maintenance animals. Um, they're probably the lowest maintenance pet you could possibly have. Um, they just eat once a week. Um, and you just wanna make sure they always have water available. And depending on the species, um, you might need to um, mist it, which is like spray its enclosure with water to keep the humidity up. Um, but I'd say in a regular day, I probably take care of my animals a little bit. And I usually have a student employee that will help me with that because uh, it is a lot of work. Even though you don't have to do it every day, uh, it still is a lot. And I have a lot of other stuff that I have to do too. Um, and also I will pack up bugs in little containers so I just put them in little travel containers. This is a takeout container from a restaurant that I just like to reuse them. Um, they live in these big tanks and they have like dirt and grass and rocks and things, but I just take them out for a little bit and I put them in little containers so they don't live in here. And I'll take all those little containers and put them in a big cooler and we call that a bug box. And so I'll take a bug box and I'll go out to classrooms um, and I will visit things. And on the, at the place where I work, which is called Waterman Farm, um, people can come and they can visit and uh, we can do tours of the farm and then they can see a bug box. Um, and I also do um, some academic programming for um, the entomology department. So I do have kind of administrative work that I do as well. Um, but a big part of my job is taking care of my animals and then taking the animals out into the world and introducing them to people, which is my favorite thing to do. This is pretty much my dream job. So I feel very, very lucky that I get to do this. Maybe one final question from Lena. Lena would like to know, what is your favorite bug? And while you're answering that, maybe all of our guests can tell us what their favorite bugs are in the chat too. Yeah, so I love so many different bugs and they're so cool. I gotta say tarantulas. I love tarantulas. They have such interesting behavior uh, and there's so many different kinds and types. And I also think they're really misunderstood. I think that people have a lot of fear and hatred towards spiders. And they're so amazing, their behavior is so cool, and they're so important to the ecosystems that they're in. Uh, and I just really wish that people would just take a little bit of time and get to know them. Because once you get to know them, they're not really that scary. Um, but I also really do like stick bugs. Stick bugs are fun. 
All right, well, I think that is about all the time we have for today. So thank you very much, Jenny, for joining us and showing us your collection and uh, answering all the questions for our guests. Thank you very much. Sure, thanks for having me, guys. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the program. We encourage you to uh, join us for our next program, which is coming up at 1 p.m. today. That program is uh, with NASA. We'll be talking to Brian Campbell, and he is going to be talking to us about the NASA ICE cloud and land elevation satellite. So that should be a super interesting program. We hope you can join us for that coming up here in about 15 minutes, and you'll actually join us for that program over over on the COSI Science Festival Facebook page. We hope to see you there. Thank you very much and have a great day.